Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Bombastic Podcast. Bomb Walker Stadium, in case we're still confused on the name, Bombastic, I'm an obnoxious guy. My name is Andrew Ellis, and this is the best baseball podcast ever. Um, without a doubt, nobody nobody's even debated at this point. Um, but yeah, welcome to episode two of the Bombastic Podcast, presented by Natty State Sports, where we are all natty all the time. Uh, we got a lot of great stuff going on here at Natty State Sports. Not just this show. Got plenty of cool stuff. I don't know if you guys saw the announcement yesterday, but the Boss Hogs podcast is coming soon. It's going to feature the Razorback O-Lineman, uh, hosted by Josh Braun, who's a stud. Uh, can't wait for you guys to hear that. Um, so football season, you know, spring for, spring practice is coming up. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world, a lot of stuff going on here at Natty State Sports. But today, we got to start with episode two of our Bombastic Podcast. I appreciate you guys for listening in and in consuming this product, however it is you're consuming it. For those wondering, we are available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Um, uh, we're also all over social media, so give us a follow at Natty State Sport. That is Natty State Sport on Twitter. Some social medias, we might be sports, but the sports was taken on Twitter. I don't know who has it, but uh, Natty State Sport on Twitter. If for some reason you feel the need to follow me on Twitter, I am at Ellis Andrew underscore. That is a horrible at name. Yes, it is a really bad at name. But when I was uh, making this move, I had to change it up, and everything everything cool was taken. And uh, it, was, it was this or like three underscores at the beginning. It was it was a whole mess. But uh, yes, that is at Ellis Andrew underscore on Twitter. If for some reason you wanted to follow me on Twitter, uh, or just follow us at Natty State Sport, not plural. Um, but if you do follow me on Twitter and you or you don't and you missed it. Yesterday at Monday's scrimmage for the Diamond Hogs, I gave a full play-by-play -play breakdown, just exactly what happened. So if you really want a detailed report of what happened at yesterday's scrimmage, go check that out. I recommend you do so. Um, a lot, of, a lot of cool, interesting stuff going on there, and it was a high-flying, high-scoring scrimmage. Um, but yeah, before we before we hop into this podcast, which you know later on I'm going to break down pretty much the entire pitching staff. Uh, last podcast, if you listen to this, episode one, if you didn't, go do that now. On episode one, we basically broke down the entire lineup and projected the starters, which made me feel really good afterwards because on Friday scrimmage, Dave Van Horn decided to do what he likes to do a lot leading up to the season, which is he basically puts the starting lineup on one side during the scrimmage. Um, again, is that guaranteed going to be the opening day lineup? No, but you could tell just by looking at it. Uh, Peyton Stovall was at second base. Kendall Diggs was at right field. It just Vahiva, Lloyd, shortstop. Some of the obvious ones are there, and it just looks like pretty much the starting lineup I gave to you guys on Friday, which made me feel really good. It would have it been really tough if I came out and just listed off this whole thing. I was like, these guys are going to start, these guys, and then none of them were right. That would have been tough. Um, but at least for the time being, it looks like I've got a chance to be maybe right. But uh, So we're going to get into that a little bit because that first scrimmage on Friday, like I said, that was like kind of our first look at what this starting lineup might look like. And... Uh, Man, they jumped all over Mason Molina, the Texas Tech transfer, who we will talk a little bit more about later. But a confirmed good arm, a very good pitcher who had a lot of success in the Big 12. And to this point in the in the offseason, had only given up one hit in all of his scrimmages. And I think it's like eight or nine, maybe 10 innings. Only one hit and zero runs. But Arkansas starting lineup put up four against him. Kendall Diggs hit a left-on-left -left home run that kind of was the nail in the coffin. Uh, they really fought him too, and and Dave really liked that. You know, he had two quick outs in the first inning, and then they extended that, end up making him throw like twenty. And then in the second inning, they really got to him. Uh, he ends up giving up four runs in an inning and two thirds, which you know we're going to expect better things from Mason Molina. But I thought it was really encouraging to see Arkansas starting lineup jump on him the way that they did. That was really good to see. And uh, Friday scrimmage was interesting. And you know, I mentioned that one of the teams had a starting line, had pretty much the starting lineup, so you'd expect it was like a thirteen to two scrimmage. It was not. Uh, the final score ended up being like seven to five, eight to six, or something in that range. But the 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 B team, if you will, I mean, I say B team, it's a ton of really talented players who have started at Arkansas before. Um, they took the lead for a little bit. They took the lead on a Will Edmondson home run. He had a three run home run to left field, four hundred and seven feet off of our guy Will McIntyre, who uh, we're not going to blame. It wasn't Will McIntyre's fault. Definitely not his fault. We don't we don't slander that guy on this show. Uh, but yeah, the 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 other lineup kind of took the lead for a little bit, and then the starters bounced back and ended up pushing some runs across. Ben McLaughlin homered, uh, Gage Wood threw pretty well. It was it was a solid day at the yard. It was like one of those like good on good scrimmages where it's like 
you know how it is in fo- football with fall camp. We're always talking. We're like, oh, the defensive line's just been crushing. They've been dominating. And we're like, all right, that's cool. So does our offensive line suck? Does that mean, you know, what, like what's going on here? You're trying to figure it out. And last year for the Arkansas Razorbacks, the answer was yes, your offensive line does suck. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's sometimes you can never really tell with these scrimmages. But I thought Friday's scrimmage was one of those where you could just tell it was highly competitive, highly skilled, back and forth. And like, I would say what was supposed to happen for the most part happened. Like, I, I thought it was really encouraging. And again, like Mason Molina gave up the four runs. He was like three pitches away from from getting out of that first inning completely unscathed and just kind of cruising. Uh, but that's what this lineup, that's what we are hoping, what we are thinking. And that's kind of the idea that it's built on is that, hey, they're going to fight you. And they've got plenty of power and they can do plenty of damage. And it might not be the first guy. It might not be the second guy. But they're hoping to wear you down. And you know, uh, we got to listen to Dave Van Horn at the Swatters Club yesterday, which is awesome. I don't know what it is about the Swatters Club, but Dave loves talking to the, that group of people. And so he, we kind of get him at his purest, like most honest open. And he, he talked for a while and he was just saying how on Friday nights, that's really the key is winning or losing is cool, but it's like getting that starter to throw a ton of pitches forces that other coach to start thinking that pressure starts to mount. You're like, all right, I need to go to my guy, but I've got three games here. And just the, when you, when you see that starting pitcher throw 26 pitches in the first inning, it just changes the entire complexion of a weekend. And so look, I'm not saying this Arkansas team is going to just crush all year, score 10 runs a game and do all this. But I do think y'all are going to like the competitive edge that this group has and it's just the tenacity. And I just look down the lineup at even some of the guys who are not viewed as like A-listers on this team, like, you know, Jack Wagner is the guy from Tarleton State. DVH says he brings a little bit of attitude, but he's he's kind of the epitome of that. Like, yeah, he, he might not hit a home run or a double every time, but he's going to fight you at the plate. He's going to get on base plenty. He's going to do damage if you make a mistake. Peyton Holt, same thing. He's he's uh, He had been pretty quiet in the scrimmages leading up to uh, this weekend, uh, you know, kind of in the middle of that lineup, a guy we project to start at third base, but he just makes things happen. He draws a walk. He steals a base. He hits a double in the gap. And then the other day he got a, uh, he got one to hit and hit a three run home run about 420 feet. Uh, so it's just that, that you just look down the lineup. There's not really places you can rest. There's not a, I feel like I've been knocking John Bolton a lot on this podcast. And I don't mean to do that because I love John Bolton. He's my guy. Uh, and I, I love what he brought. I thought he was an awesome shortstop in the field for Arkansas last year. And, you know, stepped up and did did the job that they needed someone to do, and he just happened to be the guy who won it. Um, but I just I just look at last year's lineup to this year's, and there's just a little bit of a difference. Whereas you get to you're kind of counting your time to get to the bottom of the lineup last year. I don't really think that's the case because you look at the bottom of the lineup with this Arkansas team, and you're looking at Peyton Holt and potentially Jason Jones, Jack Wagner, and Ty Wilmsmeyer, who's played a ton of ball in the SEC, hit over 300 last year. It's like it's not really a let up there. Um, but you know, again, interesting, good to see that starting lineup come out there and play and play well together and, you know, really have some success against some good arms. Uh, we did not get to see Saturday's scrimmage because it was in the indoor facility. It was raining. The weather was tough. Um, but I have it on very good authority that, uh, Jason Jones did hit a 415 foot home run. My authority on that one again is Dave Van Horn. Uh, again, if you're in the indoor facility, I don't know if you can count it a home run, but he said the track man had it at 415, so they're going to assume that that ball would have probably gotten out even if they had been outdoors. Um, also got a notice or got a note here that Peyton Stovall had four hits in the, in the two scrimmages that we were able to watch on Friday and Monday. Um, seems to be swinging it well. He got hit in the foot with a pitch, and so they stopped. They didn't let him run. They were telling him not to run out of the box. Even I mean, he had a base hit afterwards where he didn't even run out of the box, but it's like, the guy can still swing it. He's going to be fine. I saw some people kind of freaking out about that on Twitter. He left the scrimmage. It didn't run, but it was very clearly they were trying to just take it easy with him. And with Peyton Stovall, why would you not? But swing looks good. And, you know, I asked Dave about Peyton yesterday at the Stovall or at the uh, the Swatters Club, not the Stovall Club. Um, but I asked him, I was like, you know, D1 Baseball had him as like the 48th second baseman in the country behind Ethan Bates, former hog, who's now at Louisiana Tech and playing great balls. It's not a not a knock on Ethan Bates at all, but I thought it was hilarious that Stovall was ranked below him because Ethan Bates transferred out of Arkansas because he could not play over Peyton Stovall. Um, and again, love Ethan. I you know know him. I've I've talked to him. He know people that know him. He's awesome. He's a great player, and he's he deserves to be on that list. Um, but I think I, when I told Dave that he had kind of the same reaction I did, which was like, love Ethan, but like that's a little crazy. And I think this they don't realize the changes that Stovall has made this off season. That shoulder was really bugging him, guys. I know I've said it. I said it last podcast. I've said it before. I'll probably say it five more times before the season starts. We did not see the real version of Peyton Stovall last year. 
And what's crazy is even a week before he finally shut it down and had the surgery, he had a, he had a grand slam against Texas A&M. So we're talking about a guy that was grinding through it. Um, so it was really good to see him starting to swing that bat the way that we've, we, we've grown accustomed to expecting from him. Uh, swing looks sharp, and I'm, I'm excited to watch that guy play baseball. And he's, he, he's looked great in the field, too. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yesterday's scrimmage, which, again, if you want the play-by-play, go to my Twitter account, LSAndrew underscore. Uh, even though the horrible at name, it has great updates there. Literally play-by-play, everything you could possibly want. It was all freshman pitcher day, which usually means that the final score is going to end up being 10 to seven after four innings. Um, and it was eight to three after the first inning. It was a, uh, it was a chaotic day. Vahiva Loy homered again. Uh, Peyton Holt hit the home run I, re- I referenced earlier. And two guys I want to mention that I did not project to start last week and I'm not projecting them to start this week, but Jared Spraglot and Reese Robinette, big country who I love, man. I really love big country. I, and Spraglot, I feel bad for him because he's a really good ball player. I just I just think this is like the one of like the five teams in the country that he's not going to be the starting third baseman or second baseman on. Uh, it just kind of is what it is. But both of those guys homered yesterday. Uh, Robinette, man, when he connects with a ball, it's beautiful. A big country, there's nothing sweeter than a big country rope leaving the yard at like 108 miles an hour. Um, but Spraglot got, got a ride of one, got sent it like 402 to left center. Um, those guys have been swinging it well, and I think it just, again, speaks to the depth and just what this team has. But fun week of scrimmages. Uh, again, if you want to get more updates, you can find those on Twitter. Um, I'm I'm just really looking forward to watching this team. I can't wait till, till I can watch them play again. Um, and I'm, I'm enjoying watching them play against each other, but I really can't wait to watch them play against someone else. Um, and when they do play against someone else, they might be wearing some some new, maybe some interesting jerseys. And if you want to know more about those jerseys, head on over to Alumni Hall on College right by the Whole Foods. When you get done shopping for your Whole Foods, like Curtis Wilkerson does, stop on over at Alumni Hall. And if you don't want to get out and go, and you're not in the Fayetteville area, whatever the case may be, visit nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall. Guys, I referenced the jerseys. I, I, we, we, are, we are pretty sure that Arkansas is going to have a different uniform, maybe not a completely new ever everything, but Arkansas will be mixing in at least one new uniform, and the guys over at Alumni Hall have it. They also have all the hats, all the child's clothes, all the kid, the, the pet's clothes, men, women, for large folks, for small folks, for medium folks. They got it all. Truly the best selection, the ultimate Razorback shopping destination. I, I support those guys 100%. You should, too. Again, that's nattystatesports.com slash Alumni Hall. You will not be disappointed with what you find, and if you're a baseball guy, you will really enjoy the hats and the new jerseys and all the stuff they've got. So if you want to get a, get a look at what the Hogs are, are wearing, just head on over to Alumni Hall. And uh, we appreciate you tuning in and supporting those guys as well as, as well as supporting us. Um, so, hey, let's, uh, let's turn the page and let's, let's just get into it. Let's just talk about this Arkansas pitching staff. Again, guys, like there's about 14 guys realistically that you could make a case for as like they need to be pitching real innings on this team. I say 14. You could probably make a case for more than that. I mean, literally every guy on this roster, they're on it for a reason. I mean, this is the most talented baseball team I've ever seen at Arkansas. So before I even start and before I kind of sound like I'm dismissive of anyone, it's not that. Every single name I'm about to list is a supremely talented pitcher who could pitch and pitch well at Arkansas, and they could pitch well anywhere. Um, but obviously just the way it is, not all of them are going to get that chance, especially as the season progresses and the innings get a little tighter and you start to lean on some of those older arms a little bit. So uh, particularly with the younger guys, when I reference them as, you know, maybe, maybe they're a year away. Like I'm not saying that because the guys are bad. Like it just is what it is. And uh, you know, I mentioned, I just, I just told you there was a 10 to seven scrimmage yesterday that featured five freshman pitchers. So, I mean, if you do the math there, not all these guys I'm about to list, list are going to be able to contribute in a meaningful way. Um, but, hey, let's start at the top. Let's start at the top with the easy ones. This is Arkansas weekend rotation. This is as clear-cut as an Arkansas weekend rotation coming into the season as I can ever remember. I remember in the fall, like, when someone asked me, like, hey, who do you think is going to be the starting rotation? And I kind of, like, looked at him funny because I was like, if you, you know, if, it's it's obviously Hagen Smith's going to be in there. Guy who was an All American last year, first team All SEC with Paul Skeens. Ever heard of him? Uh, guy who started in the past was a weekend starter as a freshman. I know he closed a lot of games last year, and his role kind of fluctuated with Arkansas situation. Hagen Smith's a 
a top five pitcher in the country. I feel comfortable saying that. Might be the best left-handed pitcher in the country, and he's the preseason SEC pitcher of the year. So it's not even a stretch to say he's the best pitcher in the country or the best pitcher in the SEC at least. Um, this guy's a stud, man. I mean, eight and two as a freshman, or seven and two as a freshman, I should say. Four seven seven ERA. Closed some games that year down the stretch, if you remember, in Stillwater. Uh, comes back the next year as kind of the ace. Starts the year off strong. Moves to a closer role because he was kind of struggling to work deep into games, which is something that I know people really love to to nitpick with Hagen Smith. Uh, really was kind of struggling to work deep into games. And Arkansas, just frankly, with Brady Tiger on the shelf, Gage Wood still being 14 years old, they just didn't feel great about their closing situation. So they, they, they used the cheat code and put their best pitcher in that role. And obviously they had Hunter Holland to kind of help them make that work. But uh, I don't think there's not going to be any weird debates about where Hagen should pitch or when he should pitch. Hagen's a weekend starter for this team. He's the Friday night starter. He's going to be a stud. Be on the right side of history. Hagen Smith's awesome. He's probably going to be a first-round pick. I uh, I think everyone should be enjoying however many outings it is you have left with him. I I, I could not be more in and buying as much, it, collect as much Hagen Smith stock as you can. This is a guy who I mentioned last year. He had a 3-6-4 ERA. It was 8-2, 109 strikeouts last year. Uh, massive year as a sophomore. And again, this is a guy who was doing this while his role was up in the air, starting some weekends, closing, kind of being thrown into these weird situations. And, you know, DBH even admitted yesterday that he might have worn down a little bit throughout the year just because of the load he was carrying, you know, mental, physical, like pitching every week and maybe maybe twice a weekend, some weekends. Like, it was a lot. And uh, he feels like down the stretch, it wasn't really the best version of Hagen. And I know that Hagen, you, when you talk to him, you know, his last start was against TCU and he ends up leaving in, I think, the second or third inning. They really jumped after him and, that TCU team was hitting everybody that weekend, but Hagen really take, took it personally. I mean, as most of these guys, these are competitors. That's what they do. But when you talk to Hagen and you ask him about kind of last year, that's the first thing he says. He didn't even say, oh, yeah, it was a great year. and what He just is like, well, it didn't end the way I wanted it to. And I still think about that. You know, it's, you could tell this is a dude who really carries that with him. Uh, man, he's got, the, he's got the mentality. He's got the stuff. The stuff is up also. I mean, if you remember Peyton Smith pitching last year, you're thinking lefty 93 to 95, who was electric and had this wipeout slider and was mixing in all these other pitches. His stuff is better this year. He's been he's touched 100 in multiple of these scrimmages. He's consistently, it's like 96 to 98 easily. Um, the velo will dip a little bit throughout the game, which again, like, all right, so is, is going from 100 to 95, 96. Is that, is that a dip that y'all are willing to live with? Because that's one you might have to live with. Um, but again, I think that Hagen is, he's bigger, he's stronger mentally. He's in the right place. I think this off season was big for him because got to go pitch at team USA and throw a little bit, but not too much. So it's not like he's exhausted. I think he's refreshed, ready to go. I think he's about to have a massive year. Um, and then Brady tiger, maybe the most polarizing of these three options here, just because his career has been so, you know, interesting, you know, he comes in as a freshman. And he misses most of the fall. Like, I remember as a freshman when he came in, and, you know, he was a pretty pretty notable recruit. Like, everybody kind of knew him coming out of Hernando. And he was kind of a late bloomer in high school as well. I, mean, I don't know if people remember. Like, I remember it was kind of a stretch. Like, he, he came on late. But I think by the time he got to Arkansas, people knew he was a stud. Um, but I remember him being banged up as a true freshman coming into the year. And I, I just kind of wrote him off. I was like, all right, probably, he's probably a year away. We'll find out next year. Uh, then leading up to the season, they, you could tell they started to like him. And then as soon as the season started, after about three or four outings, it was very clear. I was like, oh, this guy's not only going to help them, he's helping them right now, and he might be as, as good as any pitcher on the team. I mean, he had moments as a freshman where it was sacrilegious. People were upset about it, but he was getting compared to Kevin Copps because statistically, his first few closing situations in the SEC, he was as dominant as Kevin Copps. I mean, he he looked unhittable at times. I mean, he had that big wipeout curveball. He's pretty much mostly fastball curveball as a, as a true freshman, but... And it was, a, it, was a, it was a combo that people were struggling with and kind of allowed people to think about what his future could be. Um, and then and then as most freshmen do, like Hagen did, like Gage Wood did last year, like plenty have done before them, Brady kind of wore down throughout that freshman year. And again, you're closing games in the SEC as an 18-year-old. You know, you're pitching in these different situations. Your season's also longer than you're, you're accustomed to it in high school. He kind of wore down and down the stretch struggled to... to kind of maintain his closing role and Arkansas had to kind of piece it together a little bit. Kind of happens with freshmen, but he comes back in the offseason. Seemed like he was on track to have another big year. I mean, his first, I remember his first closing situation of his sophomore year was in Arlington. It might have been the best I've ever seen him throw. I mean, he was mixing in that slider that he's that he that he threw so well last year. 
fastball is electric, curveball is electric, as always. Like, you're really starting to see, like, oh, this guy might have taken a jump. He might be an even better version of the borderline dominant closer he was as a freshman. And then he gets banged up after like three outings. And I think we all kind of thought Tommy John was what was happening. I, I don't, that's a word I, I shouldn't say that, the TJ word, but uh, that's kind of where it looked like it was going. He ends up resting for a while and ends up coming down and coming back down the stretch and they work him into a starting role, which I think uh, most would agree. Brady Tiger, we all viewed him as a potential future starter. I mean, even as a freshman after his first few outings, DVH was saying that. I think last year when he came back from injury, that was the perfect time to start mixing him into that starter role and they got to ramp him up that way. And so he pitches one inning in his first start back, maybe two innings in the next one kind of ramps up. Then by the end of the year, he's pitching five innings in the NCAA tournament uh, having one of the better outings we've seen. I think we are just like, that is the tip of the iceberg with what we can see from Brady Tiger as a starter. I mean, you look at the arsenal of stuff. It might be the most complete on this, this pitching staff, especially with the starting rotation mentioned the fastball. That's kind of in the 92, 94 range. Perhaps there's a little bit more juice there for him to get to 95, 96 with some adrenaline who knows. And we've seen his, his velo fluctuate a little bit. Um, but what's crazy is his fastball might be his worst pitch. And I don't say that because his fastball is not good, but I mean, you just look at that curveball, which is a legit plus pitch, high spin rate offering. The slider last year was a huge development. And I remember him in the NCAA or in the SEC tournament mixing in his changeup pretty well, looked nice there. I'm I'm really a big believer in kind of what Brady Tiger can bring to the table as a starter. Might have as high a ceiling as any of these guys. And I think a lot of draft, you know, scouts and people I've talked to in that area are really intrigued by what he's going to do because you know, we just really haven't been able to see a full sample size of what this guy can bring to the table on the mound for a full season in a consistent role. And so I think that's what excites me about his opportunity he has here, here now as a junior, where it's like you're in a starting role. Hopefully he's put, you know, any any injuries and stuff behind him and he can just move forward mentally, physically, and be the dominant starter that we kind of all thought he might be when he first came onto the scene as a true freshman. Uh, so Brady Tiger, exciting option. Cannot wait to watch him pitch. Mason Molina, the Texas Tech transfer who I just mentioned, and you're probably saying, hey, that's the guy that just gave up four runs to our starting lineup. He sucks. Uh, no. Like I said, that was his, the first runs he had given up all offseason, so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to let that one pass. He's an interesting one. He was the Texas Tech ace last year. Not just a weekend starter, not just a guy who has a ton of experience. The weekend ace for Texas Tech. He went 6-2 and two with a 3-6-7 ERA. 108 strikeouts and 83 innings pitch. This is a lefty who is, from a stuff standpoint, not quite like a as dominant like wipeout stuff. But I just showed you the strikeouts: 103 and 83, or 108 and 83 innings. And that's a big time number. He struck out a ton of dudes this fall, uh, or this fall and off season altogether. 91, 93 with the fastball. It's not like blow you away stuff, but just one of those lefties that knows how to pitch. Uh, not, I wouldn't say crafty. I feel like he throw he's, he's stuff's a little bit too good to be considered a crafty lefty, but, uh, I love, love his mental makeup, love the way he mixes speeds. Walks got a little high in the off season, but I don't think it's a huge thing. I mean, his walk rates lower than, than Tiger and Smith's for his career. Um, I, I feel good about what he brings. I think he's like, I think if you went in a lab and we're like, Hey, what's like the best possible Sunday starter we could make. You would come out with something that looks a little bit like Mason Molina. And I think it's interesting because you think about these other two guys that I mentioned, especially Hagen, who's a lefty that's coming at you with just power stuff, big time, hard fastball, hard slider, just power, power. And then on Sunday, after you've seen these two guys who have completely different arsenals in Tiger and Smith, and then Wood, or and then uh, Mason Molina, who's a completely different situation as well, you're looking at more of a lefty that's mixing speeds type of thing. I think I, I love the way these three skill sets go together for a weekend. Cause if you're a team, you know, I remember Tennessee a few years ago, the Tennessee volunteers under tone of Itello had three righties that threw like 96 to a hundred. And it was awesome. It was like, Oh yeah, this team, you know, all this power and you kind of, you know, the scouts are, are lighting up the radar guns. They all love it. But it's like when you face a team like that over the course of a weekend, if all you're facing is velo, you kind of get to the point where it's like, hey, I can hit 96. You know, and obviously I'm saying this like I'm ever hitting 96. I'm saying high-level college baseball teams. And so I think it's nice when you have a starting rotation like that that has three very different skill sets, very different personalities even. I like all three of these guys and their personalities, but they are all very different. Uh, you know, Hagen is not a loud talker. I mean, you, you know, 
it's sometimes you look he looks bored almost but he's out there he's he's got like that quiet assassin killer in him that i love and you see it come out every now and then i remember his freshman year someone from kentucky pimped a home run against him and he really didn't like it and so that next inning he was kind of pitching with a little bit of attitude and every now and then you'll see him celebrate and kind of jaw a little bit but again you talk to him off the field he's not a super loud guy he's not cocky he's not like in your face at all and brady tiger is not that but he's a lot closer to that where Brady Tiger walks around with a confidence where you can tell, and he's a he likes to talk a little bit more, and he's he's a little bit more outgoing and kind of carries that swagger. And when he's pitching, man, you see it. I mean, he's 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 amped up, and that's why I loved him as a closer because he would get so amped up, and you just see him up there, kind of like twitching and stuff. Like he, I I love that kind of stuff. And so Brady Tiger's a little bit more of an eccentric kind of guy, and Mason Molina is like the perfect middle ground between the the two of those guys because he's just just cool, man. I don't know how to, how else to describe him. He's just cool. We got to talk to him a little bit after a scrimmage in the fall. He just he seems like he's got that confidence. He's not as quiet as Hagen, not quite as bombastic, I guess, as uh, Brady Tiger. Kind of a perfect mix of those other two guys. I think they're three personalities. I don't know how they interact with each other. I don't. Know. They might secretly hate each other. Who knows? Um, but I just really like the mix for that starting rotation. If you can keep, I think you just gotta keep those guys in a in a hyperbaric chamber until the season starts. Maybe even keep them there till April. I think that Arkansas needs to just be appreciating every moment they have with this group right here. I think it's a fun one. And uh, so I've kind of broken down the remainder of the pitching staff into some categories. And these are some interesting categories here. Some of them are a little vague, and some of them just kind of are, are pretty straight to the point. Um, I'm going to start with the vets here. We've got the vets, which are Will McIntyre and Cody Frank. Again, I know there's some people who will look at both of those guys and say, ah, you know, they're like 90 to 91. Don't really light up the radar gun. like. Are we sure like these are the guys that are going to be doing it? Yes. I'm not saying these are going to be your closers. These are going to be your like every single game. They're the first guys out the bullpen or whatever. But in Will McIntyre's case, for sure, I can tell you he is going to be used and used a lot. Um, this is just a guy that you can trust. And really, I, both of these guys, I mean, Will McIntyre has 143 career innings to his name, which is pretty crazy considering he redshirted one year and didn't pitch until mid-April in another season. But these last two years, they've really called his number a lot and leaned on him. It's got a career four ERA, 139 strikeouts and 143 innings. So again, it's not like blow you away, like he's just mowing dudes down. But we've seen Will McIntyre pitch a lot of valuable innings for this Arkansas program over the last few years. None bigger than the College World Series in 2022 when he goes seven innings, ties Isaiah Campbell, I believe, for the most strikeouts by a hog in Omaha. Like Will McIntyre, I don't care what his stat line is. I don't care what his numbers say. I don't care what he did in his last start. I don't care what anything says. When he's on the mound, I just trust him to get guys out. And Dave Van Horn trusts him to get guys out. Matt Hobbs trusts him to get guys out. And he's gotten a lot of guys out in his career, and I think he's going to continue to do that. We'll see what the role is. I think it's going to kind of fluctuate and be whatever they need it to be on a given weekend. And I think he's the perfect guy for that. And Cody Frank, who's coming off of a, a lat injury, which made him miss most of last year. I think he threw 11 innings for Arkansas before going down. But if you remember, he threw 11 and two-thirds innings in like two weeks for Arkansas. Like he was getting used a lot. They were throwing him in midweeks, throwing him in mid-relief, getting him to close stuff. Like he has done it all in his career. He started some games at Nebraska before he came to Arkansas, closed some games for Nebraska. His junior year, he threw 59 innings, which is a very healthy number for a guy who is not like a weekend starter. 3-8-1 ERA with 70 strikeouts. Like, again, not your blowaway stuff or anything. He's not going to be mowing guys down. He's not like a, hey, we really need a strikeout. Let's bring this guy in. But... I think he's a kind of fill the bridge kind of guy. He's going to pitch some innings for Arkansas. We'll see how he works. I mean, he's, he's pitched a couple times now after coming back from injury. Looked a lot better in his second outing than he did his first. So we'll kind of monitor his progress. But those are two guys where it's like, come hell or high water. I just know that this coaching staff is going to trust him, especially early on, because you got all these talented arms that we'll get into. But uh, you're going to need some of those older guys to fill some stuff when you don't necessarily expect it to. Or you send a young guy out there and he shits down his leg, like you're going to need that older guy to come in and and figure that out. And so I think both those guys are going to get called on way more than people realize. Um, this next category I have is, is titled groomed for a starting role. Uh, we're kind of bouncing around here, but these are, these are more younger guys. Again, I just told you that Arkansas has three weekend starters and there's no doubt about who those three weekend starters are. You could argue that if you really want to, I'm not going to argue it with you. I mean, th those are three weekend starters. So th this group here, is interesting because Arkansas is not going to be counting on these guys to start weekend games, which is a huge luxury. 
that you're not having to figure out if these guys are good while they're pitching against weekend teams and weekend arms and having to see how that goes. But Arkansas does play four games on the opening weekend against James Madison. Again, not like your SEC competition, but there will literally be four people start a game for Arkansas opening weekend. And so I think it's kind of up for grabs right now. And so these four guys I'm about to list, I feel like are the most likely candidates. There could be plenty of other guys. I mean, two, the, the two guys I just mentioned have started games before. They could easily do that if they needed to. There's a few other returning guys that I think could work into that role. But Ben Bybee is the one sophomore that kind of sticks out to me here. So one, he started a ton of midweek games for Arkansas last year. I want to say might have even started a weekend game or two, but guy that they clearly have viewed as a potential starter. Um, Stuff-wise, he has the arsenal. I mean, his fastball gets into the 92, 95 range. Sometimes he's ran it up over to 96, like kind of mid-90s ceiling type of guy. Mixes in a few different off-speed offerings. Uh, again, like doesn't necessarily have wipeout stuff. Like as a freshman, I felt like he was struggling to put guys away at times but has like the arsenal there where you can kind of, and he's a big guy, projectable, also really well-spoken kids. It's like, I'm cheering for him. Those are the guys we always want to do well because it's a lot easier to cover guys like that who will, you know, articulate how they feel and give you good quotes on stuff. And so we love that. Uh, But Ben Bybee, you know, he's currently dealing with a little bit of a hamstring issue. He did not throw this past weekend. That is a precaution according to DVH. And DVH even said that Ben was like, pushing them to try and let him pitch, but they're just trying to get him healthy because he's an option for this this uh, this fourth starting situation. Um, and so we'll see how, if he comes back to action this next week, and I'll be interested to see what that looks like and kind of what he has moving forward. He had an awesome summer in the California League, starting games there. Uh, struggled a little bit down the stretch like most of Arkansas's freshmen did. I mean, all these guys I'm about to list here that are sophomores kind of struggled down the stretch as they wore down, but that's just kind of, I mean, you don't want it to happen, but that's just kind of part of it and you know, you can't depend on freshmen and, and Arkansas will use a lot of freshmen, but you can't like count on them for that reason is because it's just hard to get a freshman arm to pitch well for you for six months straight or however long it is, however long you're playing. Um, but Ben Bybee is an interesting one. I feel like the sophomore class for Arkansas is kind of the wild card here on this team. I mean, in the lineup, it's guys like Jason Jones, but I think on this pitching staff, you're looking at Ben Bybee and Parker Coyle and a Christian Fouch and a few other names I'm going to get into later. But I think Ben Bybee has a chance to be that kind of weekend or midweek starter who is being groomed for a starting role. Um, another guy I think everyone needs to be familiar with is Gabe Gackle, uh, big right-handed arm, mid nineties, like plus plus stuff. Has a big breaking ball, mix of speeds, and I mean, on paper is is a weekend starter in the SEC. I mean, he's got the ninety-five mile an hour fastball. He throws three pitches for strikes. Like you see him out there, and you're like, oh, that guy looks like a stud. Um, as most freshmen are, it's a little up and down in these scrimmages. He'll have moments where it's like, oh, wow, he's he looks awesome. He's unhittable. Like, he's really doing this. Um, but then he'll have moments where he gives a big home run or he walks a guy, and it's like, just like most freshmen are. So, I, I, again, it's nice that Arkansas has the luxury of having these three older starters that they can count on to where you can kind of work some of these younger guys into this role. And so I think Gackle's going to be a guy that they will kind of groom over these next year, year and a half, or however long it is. Could, both of these guys I just mentioned could help you on the weekend as well. Um, a couple more freshmen I wanted to mention in this case. Colin Fisher, lefty, who, I'll be honest with you, two weeks ago I would not have included in this role, but he had a tremendous two-inning start a couple weeks ago. Uh, got another starting nod yesterday. Gave up a three-run home run to Peyton Holt, so that was a tough one. But he bounced back really well, finishes outing, throws a ton of strikes. Lefty, he's like 91 and 93. Uh, I, I really like the way he pitches, and I think he's got a chance. And, and DVH mentioned him as a potential four starter yesterday, so I know he's kind of thinking there too. And uh, Tate McGuire, a right-handed pitcher, I would say the right-handed version of Colin Fisher in that way, but uh, really struggled yesterday. Gave up seven runs, and I guess I don't, I don't know if he got out of the first inning. Maybe if he did, he maybe got one and a third or whatever, but really struggled yesterday. And like a lot of these freshmen have had their ups and downs. I mean, dude, I remember Gage Wood last year. His first outing in the fall was walk, 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 grand slam to Peyton Stovall, hook. And I just remember being like, man, it's tough, man. These freshmen, it is what it is. And that's a guy in Gage Wood who ended up closing games for Arkansas as a true freshman. So it's like, look, having a bad outing here and there as a freshman in, in a fall ball scrimmage, it does not disqualify you from being a good pitcher. If that were the case, literally none of these guys I've listed, including the older guys, would be able would be counted on. So, uh, look, I'm not trying to overreact, but I think Colin Fisher and Tate McGuire are two guys who have been getting starting nods in these scrimmages, had their moments, I think are maybe 
they're viewing them as potential starters in the future. They're not going to start on the weekend this year, but I think those are two names to remember, and we'll see how they pitch in these next couple of weeks. I don't think it's out of the question that either guy ends up kind of working into that midweek starting role by the end of the year. Um, now, this next category is kind of the the biggest boomer bust area, and I think it's the most important area for this pitching staff. I have it titled as back end wild cards, back end of the bullpen wild cards. Gage Wood is the is the frontliner here. I think in a perfect world, you know, Gage Wood closed games for Arkansas last year. Um, he had a pretty good freshman year. I mean, he was the SEC All Freshman Team. He finished his ERA finished at four point eight, uh, which was. If you, you know, at one point down the stretch, his numbers were a lot better than that, but he struggled in his last few outings, had 42 strikeouts and in 30 innings. That's a, that's a really strong number there for a freshman. In a perfect world, I think Gage Wood kind of emerges and is your go-to closer. Now, DVH said they don't really plan on having a, like, lockdown guaranteed closer, uh, at least not to start the season. They'll probably try a few guys out there, but I think in a perfect world, Gage Wood kind of fills that role and everyone can kind of fill in around him. Um, but I think Arkansas, you know, they have plenty of these guys like that who super talented. I mean, Gage Wood has your closer stuff. He runs it up into the 95 mile an hour range. Huge, big overhand curveball, which I love. And he'll mix it in. He throws a couple different breaking balls. that He's he started to mix in for strikes more down the stretch of his freshman year. Uh, I really like the arsenal there. And mentally, when Gage Wood is locked in and he's confident and he's on, he's a bulldog, man. We saw him in the, at home, especially last year, have some times where he just, he would go into that zone where he just was, unhittable you know he really it it was fun to watch and so i would love to see him kind of step up and take that next progression and be the can be just basically a more consistent version of what he was as a freshman i I would settle for that i think that's that's huge and i don't think arkansas is going to depend on him for as many three inning saves as they were trying to do last year which i think probably contributed to him faltering a little bit down the stretch and getting worn down uh christian fouch is another another arm that i'm just like utterly fascinated by so Christian Fouch is like 6'6", 220. He's a big kid, massive kid. He throw His fastball will get up into the 95 to 97 range. I mean, I've seen him run it up 98 before last year. Uh, weird throwing motion, but the ball just explodes out of his hand. And I tell you, I remember last year going into the season, talking to a few different pitchers and being like, hey, who's, a, who's like an arm that's kind of stuck out to you? And there was like three or four guys who were like Christian Fouch. He's got this splitter, man. It's unhittable. I asked hitters, some hitters, and, they, and Tavian Josenberger. I asked, I asked Tavian Josenberger last year, who's the hardest guy to hit against on the team? And he's like, oh, Christian Fouch, man. Tough. Can't hit that splitter. I'm like, what? You know, and like this is, this is a guy, again, we're talking about some of these freshmen who are up and down. Last year in these scrimmages, Christian Fouch was just as up and down as all these other freshmen I'm talking about. And so I just, it kind of threw me off, but I think it speaks to just how weird an at-bat is against a 6'6 guy who throws 97 and then will mix in a splitter here and there. It's like, just a fascinating arsenal. Uh, he had a really productive summer in the Northwoods League. He was, I believe he was teammates with Jason Jones out there and Cooper Dawson, who I'm about to mention here later. Uh, he had a productive summer where he got some reps. His strikeout numbers were really high. Still plenty of inconsistency. For him, I think the key is his fastball has a lot of this rising action. I think when he's attacking hitters up in the zone and then throwing that, that splitter behind it. Uh, and look, I keep calling it a splitter. That's what I've heard other people call it. DVH the other day was like, yeah, he's got this pitch. He didn't even call it a splitter. It's just this pitch. So look, I don't know. It's kind of like the Kevin Cobbs thing. Maybe it'll turn into a pitch where we're just like, we don't know what it is, but it's awesome. We've had a few of those in Arkansas baseball history lately. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see Fouch's development, but he's had some he's had some good outings this offseason, had some shaky ones as well. I, I want to see what, what sophomore year Christian Fouch looks like. And if he's a guy that they can count on to get outs late in the game, doesn't have to be as a closer, but maybe seventh inning, one out, Runners on first and second. Got a couple big right-handed bats coming up. We got to get someone to come get these dudes out. I want to see Christian Fouch turn into that guy where I don't think Arkansas needs him to go two, three, four innings. I don't think that's the right role for him. I think he is a high leverage, big spot right-handed pitcher that you can throw in the end of games. And so I'm excited to see his progression, see what kind of steps he takes in year two. Didn't get to see him throw. I guess he threw Saturday. I didn't get to see him throw this weekend. But uh, I'm really fascinated by the kid from Littleton, Colorado. Arkansas had some good Colorado players over the years here. And uh, Cooper Dossett, who I just mentioned, is Springdale boy. Uh, pitched a little bit last year. There were times going into the year where I thought Cooper Dossett was like the best freshman arm they had. He uh, was banged up when he first got to campus, but worked really hard to get healthy and get back. Uh, pitched a little bit in the beginning of the year. Probably should have just went ahead and redshirted him while he was dealing with his injuries. But, uh, you know, again, 
in this range of like his stuff is there. I mean, he's, he's 93, 94 with the fastball, mixes in some breaking balls, uh, throws strikes for the most part. Summer was a little up and down where he was he was starting games in the summer for the Northwoods League. I think he was teammates with Fouch and Jones and all these guys. Uh, had some, I remember one start in particular I was watching of his where he throws three innings, lights out, and then that fourth inning, things just fall apart. So if you look at his numbers from the summer, not quite as good as you would expect for an SEC guy pitching the Northwoods League, but he was better than they indicated. His strikeout numbers were pretty solid. Uh, Cooper Dawson is another one like to keep an eye on. We're still kind of waiting to see if he's going to be able to stay healthy or if he's going to be able to take that jump and be a dude they can count on. But kind of like Fouch, like the, the the situation I just listed with him, like I think Dawson's another dude where it's like you come into a big situation against a right-handed bat. I would love to see them give him some of those opportunities to see if he can do with that, you know, do, get those outs and, and be that guy in those situations. And look, they don't need all these guys that I'm listing to do this. They just need a couple of them. And so I think it's nice that Arkansas has these options and, one of the most fascinating ones they have is Jake Faraday, who is now a junior at Arkansas. I believe he's from St. Louis area. Before he even pitched a game at Arkansas, he he captured the intrigue of the fan base because there was a video of him in a pitching lab going viral of him throwing 98 and all these spin rates and everything. I mean, his spin rates are unreal. If you're like really into the analytics and the spin rates and all the pitch, you know, depth and all these things, all the numbers of the track man, Jake Faraday is your guy. And he's also that guy for a lot of scouts because, I mean, he was pitching the Cape Cod League, and I'm seeing all these tweets from guys, these scouts from Perfect Game that are, like, hyping him up as a guy who could be, like, a fourth, fifth-round draft pick, which is crazy because he's only pitched two innings in his collegiate career at Arkansas, neither of which went particularly well. Um, but, I mean, when you throw 97-98, and it's, and it's an easy 97-98, uh, and you mix in this just hammer slider. I think he's throwing a cutter or something now. Like he 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 just one of those fascinating guys. He reminds me a little bit of Jacob Costi Shock, if y'all remember him from a few years ago, where had this we all we always knew we had the stuff. It was just a matter of him putting it together. And then finally, as a junior, Jacob Costi Shock was able to be that kind of seventh, eighth inning setup guy that we had all hoped he could be. I think Jake Faraday could be on a similar career arc. Uh, what's funny is like no matter what he does this year, he is going to get drafted and he is probably going to sign for a more money than people expect. I'll just say that uh, he's really intriguing to scouts. He's intriguing to me. He's put together a couple good outings here lately. Um, still, still a little wild at times. Uh, still will throw one off the backstop when he gets bored. It happens. Uh, but I, I think he's another one you can throw into this mix of. Will they take that next step? And again, we don't. It's not like I'm saying, hey, they need Gage Wood to be great, they need Fouch to be great, they need Faraday to be great, and they need Dawson to be great. These are your wild cards for a reason. Not all of them are going to pan out. If they all do, Arkansas is going to be a lot more loaded than anyone realizes. Uh, but I think you just need one or two from this group to really step up and be a dude you can count on. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of their progression. I also want to touch on this category, which I couldn't come up with a better term for it, so I just titled it The Lefties. These guys are unequivocally, without a doubt, left-handed. And uh, nobody is more left-handed than Stone Hewlett, the, the transfer from Kansas that Arkansas got in. Guys, there's not much to discuss here. They brought him in for one reason. He gets left-handed batters out. You look at his numbers from Kansas, you know, not, not going to blow you away. Kind of like a ERA around four, strikeout about one in inning. Like, it is what it is. His, his stuff. Not going to blow you away either. Like 90, 91, 92, mixes in a slider, can throw a changeup, but it's really just fastball slider for the most part. He gets lefties out, man. He just gets them out. Uh, I've seen him get a lot of Arkansas lefties out this fall. I've seen a lot of righties hit off of them. There is no nuance to this. Stone Hewlett is a left-on-left -left specialist, and he's a pretty good one. That's what that's what we're looking at here. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if there's there's much more to get into it after that. Now, Parker Coyle is, is another guy that I expect they will use in left-on-left -left situations, but I could see them extending him a little bit, and I think Parker Coyle has had a really, really productive offseason. Uh, he went and pitched up at the Cape Cod League with his boy Jake Faraday and had one really weird outing where he gave up like 10 hits and four runs, but uh, Parker Coyle bounced back and had a really good stretch in the Cape Cod League. Went like five or six outings without getting giving up a run, got some really valuable experience, and this is a guy who started some games for Arkansas last year, Close some games, close an SEC game against Texas A&M, uh, throws a ton of strikes, which like younger arms, that's always kind of the thing, like with Fouch and Wood and all these guys. It's like, all right, yeah, they got all this great stuff. Will they throw strikes? Parker Coyle doesn't have the neck, the same level of like stuff where he's mid-90s and blowing stuff by guys, but he's he's 
starting to add to his repertoire a little bit, getting into that 91 to 93 velo range, which is nice for a left-handed pitcher there. And again, throws a ton of strikes, mixes speeds. I think he's a guy who, similar to like McIntyre and Frank, can kind of bridge the gap for Arkansas a little bit. I think he could also be, you know, we, we talked about who might start that fourth game. I think he's a starting option also because of his ability to throw a ton of strikes and mix speeds. So maybe he he starts midweek games. Maybe he's the primary mid, re, mid middle relief guy for Arkansas on the weekends. Maybe he's an extra starter if someone goes down. Maybe he closes games if, if things get weird. I don't know, but Parker Coyle is going to have a role for Arkansas, and uh, he's taking a nice little jump. It's it's nice when you can really identify it. He is clearly taking a jump. I would say him and Bybee both have are leading the way in, from this group of sophomores in terms of taking a noticeable jump where we can see the improvement. Uh, so I'm excited to watch both of those those guys, Coyle and Stone Hewlett, who are both, again, unequivocally left-handed. Another guy who's clearly left-handed is a freshman, Jack Smith. I love this kid, man. He, he really is like one of my, like, I don't know if he's like my sleeper pick. I might I might just kind of put all my chips in this basket because every time I see him pitch, I come away with the same reaction, which is, man, that was better than I thought. You know, and it's not that I thought he was going to be bad. Uh, I, You know, all these guys that we're talking about are super highly recruited out of high school, had a lot of success, have great stuff. Um, from the fall to the spring, Jack Smith has taken a jump, uh, which really you don't hear that often because there's like two months in between those two things. There's like basically Christmas break, and I don't know what he was doing over Christmas break, but uh, like most freshmen, his first few outings at Arkansas completely up and down. Stuff was there. I think in the fall, he was more in the like 91, 93 range. His first outing of the spring, he was like 95, 96 and just pumping it past dudes. Um, yesterday, he did give up three runs in his second inning of work, but they brought him into a situation where there were two outs and a left-handed bat up in Ben McLaughlin, who's you know a projected starter for Arkansas, legit left-handed bat that does some damage. And Jack Smith comes in and just blows 95 right by him and gets a strikeout, a uh, big third out. I love that because it was like the exact, it was like an audition for what these some of these situations we're talking about. So it's cool to see the freshman Jack Smith, big kid, number 51, uh, extremely left-handed. When you watch him pitch, he is extremely left-handed. A little wild, a little up and down, as like all these freshmen are, but big-time stuff. Uh, I, I really like this kid, and I think he's kind of flying under the radar, and I don't think he should. I think uh, I'm not saying he's guaranteed going to have a huge role this year, but I think he's one that should be on some people's radar. So I throw him in this category. Um, I also want to touch on a few... The other freshmen here are Jay Wu Cho. Jay Wu Chu is how is how Dave Van Horn said it yesterday. From Seoul, South Korea. Uh, this is a this is a crazy one where I I can't remember Arkansas having someone from South Korea, but uh was not even ranked at all perfect game. Like they they perfect game does this thing where they put everyone at 500 once they get to a situation where they're like, all right, you know, we we just we're cutting it off here. So he's ranked, if you look at he's ranked number five hundred, but it really means he's unranked by perfect game. But and he made the team. This he's still around. Uh, they they let him stick around, which like making the team with this particular roster is pretty pretty impressive. Uh, struck out the side yesterday in his first inning. Doesn't throw hard. He's like eighty eight to ninety, but he's mixes speeds. He's deceptive. Throw. I mean, I don't know what these pitches are that he's throwing. I mean, he'll throw one. It'll be like eighty six, and you're like, all right, was that a fastball? I don't know. Then he'll throw one eighty four. Then he'll throw one eighty eight, and you're just like, are these th- three different pitches? Are they the same pitch? I don't know. Is it like Kevin Copps where they're all the same and they just break differently out of his hand? Who knows? Um, Jay Wu Chu is more of a development project. I would say him and Diego Ramos are in that like development project. You know, I'm not saying they couldn't pitch this year. Diego Ramos actually threw pretty well yesterday, I thought. Both of those guys had good outings yesterday and have had some moments in this offseason, so I wouldn't be surprised. Um, But I think them, along with Tucker Holland, who has been dealing with some type of bone issue, it's not like they're not going to have like a surgery but he's got some kind of injury that's banging him up. I would say these three guys are most likely redshirt candidates. Um, Tucker Holland especially was like a highly ranked guy. I wouldn't be surprised if any of those three ended up kind of working their way into a big role, but as of right now, we're not expecting it. Uh, but again, we'll see. I mean, I, I'm not going to rule any of these dudes out. All these guys have had their moments, uh, and like I said, sucking in a scrimmage just does not disqualify you from being a good pitcher at the University of Arkansas. Uh, just ask Will McIntyre. <laughs> if, in fact, if Will McIntyre starts throwing really well in scrimmages, we should be concerned because historically, when he throws poorly in scrimmages, he throws really well in games. So it's just kind of, kind of what you got to live with. Uh, also, four guys I sh- I have to mention because all four of these guys could help this team in a massive way this year. Um, the first of which being Hunter Dietz. The I'd say probably the most 
highly regarded freshman arm that Arkansas has. Huge lefty that throws like 97, 98. Uh, he's another one where if he's healthy, I wouldn't be surprised if he's your maybe your midweek starting type of guy. But I also wouldn't be surprised if he closes games for Arkansas, or at least is in that back end rotation because his stuff is just big time left. I mean, big time lefty throws 98 with a slider that's 89. That's all you need to know right there. That got that right there can close games in the SEC with nothing else. And so uh, I think the upside for him is kind of unlimited. And so he's a little banged up right now. I forget exactly what it is, but it's not like he's not expected to miss a ton of time. He's not not going to be ready for the start of the season, but they're hoping that he's going to be able to read, to throw in these next few weeks. And so, again, it's TBD with him uh, and these next three guys I'm about to list because I don't know when they're going to be back exactly. Nobody has a firm timeline, and we're not going to pretend that we have one on this show. But uh, Dylan Carter is another one threw a ton last year who redshirted two years ago. Came from Crowder, the JUCO ranks, in-state kid from Bentonville. Ended up being as important as like any Arkansas pitcher towards the middle of the year last year. I mean, you remember all these guys going down with injuries, and Dylan Carter was a huge reason why Arkansas was able to, you know, tread water and still win games. I mean, he came in and closed a ton of games for Arkansas through a lot of valuable innings. I mean, you think about guys like Cody Frank going down, Brady Tiger going down. Like, they needed someone to step up, and Dylan Carter stepped up. And uh, had some massive performances, gutsy outings. And if he's back and healthy, he's 100% going to help this team uh, in a big way. And so, again, he has he had uh, Tommy John surgery last year. I can't remember when the date was, but he the, the term Dave Van Horn used yesterday was way ahead of schedule. And look, they think it's possible he pitches this year. When? I'm not going to put a timeline on it. They haven't put a timeline on it. They're just going to kind of wait and see. Um, they're not going to rush him back. Obviously they're going to let him come at his own pace. So it might be may, maybe late April, who knows? Maybe he just shows up in the postseason. I don't know, but don't be surprised if you see Dylan Carter pitching big innings for Arkansas down the stretch this year. And, um, you know, we'll just see how it works out. Adam Hackman, uh, another one of their most talented freshman pitchers, big left-hander who they thought was going to have Tommy John, which is a big reason why he is a university at the university of Arkansas right now, because he did not, signed professionally because they thought he was having Tommy John. He ended up having a surgery that was not Tommy John. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what it is. I don't know how they they pulled it off, but they're thinking he might be able to pitch, you know, same kind of time frame of maybe, you know, he's not throwing yet. They're going to see if maybe down the stretch they can work him up and ramp him up into pitching at a high level. And so we'll see. I mean, that's another guy that big lefty that throws in the mid to high 90s. Like, you just add him to the list of of potential freshmen who could close or start games for you. Uh, I think Adam Hackman, if he's healthy, is going to be in that mix. I don't want to hype him up too much now since he's on the shelf for a while. Um, Josh Heineman, another one, in-state kid, Jonesboro. Uh, the last time I saw Josh Heineman pitch, I don't think he allowed a base runner. I think it was in a scrimmage leading up to last year, and I don't think he allowed anyone. Uh, he ended up redshirting last year, got banged up, had Tommy John as well. I saw a video a couple weeks ago of him throwing, so that's good to see. And that's another one where, look, and he's got good stuff too. I mean, he's 92, 94, mixes speeds well, throws a ton of strikes. Like, he's kind of a – last year I was thinking of him as a freshman who's a little bit of head of schedule almost, where it was like he doesn't have the ups and downs as most freshmen. So when he if he comes back fully healthy as a – now a, I guess a redshirt freshman, I'm going to be interested to see what Josh Heineman can do. The in-state kid – former football teammate of uh, Jashad Stewart and Riker Aspo. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure he did play football at Jonesboro. He was a good two-sport athlete. Uh, I'm, a, I, I, You know, all four of those injured guys I just listed, like, I think all four of those guys could help. And so I, I will be interested to see in monitoring their progress. But uh, that's kind of the way I view this pitching staff a little bit. I hope I didn't skip a, a, a situation here. Um, but, yeah, I think this this team... I just listed it all and all the different skill sets. They have a little bit of everything. They've got your like soft righties who are veterans that you trust. They've got your high velocity righties who can come in and get guys out. You've got your lefties that mix speeds well, like your coil and your Hewlett or a little bit in like that 90, 92 range. You've got your big high velo lefties. Your starting rotation has kind of all three of those ingredients. Uh, I love the mix of skill sets. I love all, I mean, there's some guys here that I just really, really am bullish on and look we're going to continue to monitor it all but i guess just for anyone that needed just a full-on recap or just a preview of what this pitch staff i hope that uh this served you well we went going up over 55 minutes here did not plan on going this long but you give me a mic and let me start riffing sometimes i just talk and just don't stop but uh like i said guys i love this pitching staff um i also want to i also want to throw this out here 
we're going to keep doing these shows Tuesdays and Thursdays. The format is going to just be up in the air. You know, these, these past two have been kind of just previewing the roster and getting to know some of these guys. And we'll continue to do that. But I also want to open up the forum for you guys to ask questions. I don't want there to be anything you guys are wondering about. If you if you have a question about this baseball team, drop a comment on this video, DM me, tweet at me on you know Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is. Find a way and, and just ask a question, and we will touch it on the show. I will start leaving room at some of these to where we'll just answer some of your questions. And, hey, who knows? Maybe we might do this show live one day. But uh, I want this to be interactive. I want you guys to be in on this journey with me. And, look, it's going to be a lot easier once there are games happening and things to watch and things to react to. So I look forward to you guys getting a chance to watch this team that I've been hyping up so ridiculously for the last couple of weeks. Um I, we're counting down the days. We are now at 10 days away from the start of a baseball season for Arkansas. We are Peyton Stovall days away, if you will. Um, we're excited, man. We're excited here at Natty State Sports. Again, check us out and follow us wherever you want to follow us. Tune into our shows, however you want to do it. YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, uh, podcast, however you do it. We'll he- we're here and we're bringing the content. We're having, we got a lot of stuff cooking up over here at, at Natty State Sports headquarters. Um, and I appreciate you joining in this episode two of the Bombastic Podcast. It's been a blast. Um, again, one last shout out to our sponsors, Alumni Hall. If you love the Hogs and you love Natty State Sports and you love wearing cool clothes, you're going to love Alumni Hall. Go to nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall. All the baseball gear, all the hats, all the jerseys. You can throw your dog in a baseball jersey. You can throw your seven-year-old that you don't like in a baseball jersey. You can do whatever. Uh, Alumni Hall has you covered. You can shop for the misses, shop for the mister, shop for the grandparents, shop for whoever. Um, Alumni Hall, that's nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall. Go check them out on 3417 North College Avenue in Fayetteville, right by your Whole Foods where Curtis Wilkerson gets his groceries. Um, everyone, thanks for joining me. And let's have a great day. Let's have a great day, boys. Appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you next time on Thursday. <laughs>